The narcissistic personality disordered individual is not. There's no one there. It's a performance. It's an act. It's a mirage that's been specifically and carefully designed to elicit a particular emotional and cognitive response from you. The way that I like to describe this is based on a horror movie style video game that was once in development, I don't know if it was ever created, where the enemy that you fought inside of the video game was a cloud of nanobots powered by, by AI that would look at the victim, scan them psychologically, discover their worst nightmare, and then the cloud of nanobots would show up as their most horrifying, terrifying nightmare in order to terrorize them and dominate them and to persecute them. In much the same way, the narcissistic personality disordered individual is not an individual as such. They function more like a perpetually moving cloud of nanobots powered by an artificial intelligence that is constantly scanning you for your vulnerabilities, for your weaknesses, for the things that you love and the things that you dream of. They do this very, very instinctually. They do this through intuition and give credit where it's due. While some narcissists can be quite stupid at times, this is something that in my experience, nearly all of them do quite well with no prior training. They scan the target, they figure out what the target wants, what the target fears, what the target loves, and then they show up as that with the purpose of generating a response that is emotional and cognitive, perceptual, a perceptual response. Why do they do this? Because they are entirely response focused. Now, imagine you did that for a moment. Imagine you lived your life like that in this crazy upside down world where instead of showing up as your authentic self and being who you wanted to be, you were only that which you felt would generate a certain response from a target individual, from a target group, from a target audience. That would mean that you were living a life of constantly self-entrained insincerity. That would mean that you were living a life of constantly self-entrained deception. Now, if you run a timeline where you do that for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, 15, 20, 25 years, you would meet many people, many people that you want things from. You would meet different groups, different institutions, different businesses that you would want different things from. You would meet many people that you needed to be a different person for, right? So don't be surprised when you unmask the narcissist and you find that they have been leading a double life. In my experience, I found there was a whole friend network that I had never heard of in three years of being with the girl. People I had never heard of. And I mean a whole, a whole, um, it's a central European country where attitudes to, um, to, to homosexuality are not very open. And I found out literally in a week, there was a whole network of gay friends that my ex-girlfriend had had for years. I had heard not one of their names in the previous three years. And when we broke up, they just started appearing. I started receiving messages. And I was thinking, this is very strange. And I even confronted her on this. I said, look at you. You live your life like a sleeper agent. Do you think, still think the Soviet Union is, is, is controlling your country? Do you still think that espionage and, and deception and ripping people off is the most effective way about, of going about living your life? And she admitted it to me. She said, yes, I lead a double life and I'm very good at it. I've been doing this since I was a child. She was good enough to not deny it and put me through the whole crazy making process, the gaslighting, no, 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 I'm not really like that. Richard, it's all inside of your head. You know what you're like. This is why you're in therapy because you can't trust your own perceptions. She didn't do that. She said, no, you're right. 
I do live a double life. And those friends over there, which is not just a double life, those friends over there, I need for this, this, and this. Those friends over there, I need for this, this, and this. These friends over here, I need for something else. These friends over here, I need for something else. There was all kinds of things that in my, I'm not saying you're arrogant, but I am. In my arrogance, I just didn't believe that she would have been able to keep hidden from me for three years. Not just one life, but multiple lives kept hidden from me. But then when you step back and you become cool and calm and detached and you try and analyze this in a sort of a philosophical way, you think, oh, you know, I'm a psychologist, I'm a philosopher, I'm a mechanic of, uh, of, of, of the human engine. It makes sense. It makes sense. Yes, of course, you're multiple people in multiple scenarios. Yes, of course, you're going to be different in different environments. The thing that freaked me out about this though, was that when she was with me, she presented as though she had the same, not overtly homophobic tendencies, but uh, not homophobic, like uh, more like homo dismissive. She was just like, whatever. Whatever, whatever that lot want to do. Some of her closest friends at that time and since she had been uh, 14 years old were gay. And they are in the Central European country that doesn't have very friendly views on homosexuality. One of them is a celebrity who is gay. And yet for three years, if that topic ever came up, because I have gay friends, I interview gay people, but she, you know, just a bit. Not... Never saying anything rude, never saying anything uh, insulting, but just the kind of, it was a great act. It was wonder, it was exactly what I would expect from, some, from somebody who just doesn't have a view of the world that I have and who doesn't have much time for that type of thing and dismisses it. And she tricked me, it was a perfect performance. Had she laid it on too thick and been like, oh, that's wonderful. I would have been like, that's a bit dodgy. Had she laid it on too thick the other way and gone, oh, that's disgusting. It's terrible. It's against Leviticus or something in the Bible. I would have been like, okay, that's dodgy. She played it perfectly. And I never knew. I never realized. It wasn't obviously during just the three years. It had been for the 12 years before I'd even met her. She had a network of... Not like, she has an unusually large amount of gay friends. And I had no idea. Not one. Not an idea, no indication, nothing. But when you look at this from the cold point of view, and you say, okay, but that's what you have to do to live the life you've chosen to live. Who do you need to show up as today? The perfect housewife? The perfect gay friend? the perfect employee, the perfect granddaughter, the perfect daughter. Who do you need to be today? I've said recently in a couple of seminars, and I'm gonna release a clip from one of the seminars, I'll release it tomorrow, that, and I think this is original, I think it's mine, they never see you they're not really looking at you. They're not really looking at me. They're not really looking at us. They're looking at how they look through your eyes. That's why you're there. Yes, you're instrumentalized. Yes, you are a tool. But part of the tool you always are is a mirror. 